Hey everyone, so I have two podcasts going, the Tawahado Bible Study, which is dedicated to the recitation of scripture and all things around that. And I also, of course, have the philosophy of art and science. This will be one of the few episodes that'll be a double dipping or a double whammy. Our special guest today is our sister in Christ, Bethany Saros. That, did I pronounce your name right? Yes. Okay, perfect. And she is involved at my favorite church on the planet Earth, St. <laughs> Elizabeth's Orthodox Church in the Twin Cities, formerly in Minneapolis, now in the appropriately named St. Paul, Minnesota, which of course has gone through its uh, enough recent woes within the American lens and context, but also even, I don't know how much you're aware of it, but the Ethiopian context too, It's the, the Twin Cities are a kind of a battleground of sorts. And I think the the anchor for especially those of us who identify as Christians is going to be scripture. So I, I let's start in a in a very general place because we're we're both in this kind of uh, new Pauline school, appreciators of Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, Father Mark Bulos, and and Dr. Richard Benton, and a lot of the ministry they've done with the Orthodox Center for the Advancement of Biblical Studies. And I know you have a new book, A Light in the Darkness: Bible Study for Children and Teens, that is coming out through. Uh, that has come out through that press with OCABs. So how did you get the idea for the book or how did you initially, you know, get involved with this parish and Father Paul and Father Mark and Dr. Richard? Oh man, it's been kind of a long journey. I actually went to St. Elizabeth's probably maybe like 10 or 15 years ago. I stopped in, I was still in the military at the time and I was on leave and that was kind of my first um, experience with that community. And then I remembered that it was there later. So then I kind of breezed in, talked to Father Mark, met a few people. It was really great. And then um, I came back when I got out of the military, I was pregnant with my son and I really wanted to find a church community that would, you know, a good place that was small where I could raise him. Um, so we went, to, I went to St. Elizabeth's and I think that at the time I wasn't quite ready to study the Bible the way that they study it there. <laughs> you know, I had a lot on my plate. I had, you know, a new baby coming and, um, it was just a lot. So we ended up, my husband and I ended up going somewhere else for a little while. And then meeting another, another parish or another parish close by and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we were still, a little, you know, kind of connected to some people in that uh, community, in the St. Elizabeth community. But then eventually um, we came back. <laughs> and I remember um, it was, this was like a few years later, too, when I had finished college and graduated with a degree in English literature. And I Amazing. very yeah, relevant. <laughs> <laughs> I came back and I remember when I went for the first time and I really started listening and paying attention to what Father Mark had to say and like the way that they studied the Bible. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like I've been studying English literature for all this time and never once did it ever occur to me to like apply these kind of techniques to um, studying the Bible. Like the Bible always just felt like this crusty old outdated book that didn't have anything to do with today. And but they really brought it to life for me. And I was so excited, you know, just every day, like learning something new, like the more I studied, the more I learned and like places where I thought there were holes, suddenly there were connections and it was just really amazing. And I was so excited about it. And then they asked me to teach Sunday school. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Which, you know, and I feel like being a student is so completely different from being a teacher. Oh yeah. You know, and to some degree because now you have to take what you're learning and try to not only teach other people but now you have to try to teach children. And children don't necessarily need like they don't want to dive into like the abstract so much, but they have to you have to teach them the basics. You know, and so for me, like walking in, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so unprepared. I have no experience in this whatsoever. 
and Holly Benton, who is more in, she's in charge of like the church school program at St. Elizabeth. And she was like, Oh, it's fine. Just read them the Bible. And <laughs> you know, like, it'll be okay. And she would do like word studies with them. But I was like, you've been to seminary. Like, you know, things that I don't know. Like, <laughs> what am I, how am I supposed to teach a group of these kids? And um, so I taught the class and I, it didn't go very well. <laughs> and I spoke with other parents who had also been scheduled to teach. And the more I spoke with them, we all discovered that we felt the same way. Mm -hmm. So I approached Father Mark and said, what do you think about, you know, writing a curriculum <laughs> for yeah. Sunday school? You know, because <laughs> I was like, oh, I want to, you know, have like a list, like a rubric where I can just check you know, check off the boxes and okay, we taught this. And he was like, no, no, no. Cause father Mark does not like curriculums. <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> and, I know he does not That's what I was yeah. laughing. <laughs> yeah. So, so he was like, how about instead of a curriculum, you, you write a guidebook for how to teach parents, how to teach their kids, like, you know, parents and educators, how to study the Bible, more of a how to than a, you know, step by step, curriculum and so i thought oh that's interesting and yeah so that's just kind of where it all kicked off and i had started homeschooling my children probably about a year maybe a year or two after i started writing the book and the more i learned about homeschooling the more i was able to take what i was learning and kind of incorporate it into the book like it, it comes with this idea of learning with your children rather than you know you being the, ex the all-knowing expert <laughs> like you don't have to be an expert you don't have to go to seminary to understand the bible you just maybe need like a few simple tools and i i tried to offer those tools i i really like that because i don't know if you know homeschooling is actually another interest of mine as well homeschooling and now micro schooling you know i was in plans to begin a micro school of my own i didn't i didn't have enough people end up uh, signing up talking about failures and successes. But back in January, before the whole COVID situation really blew out of the proportion of a lot of people's expectations, I had already thought of that. And I know now I see people on Indeed and Craigslist like posting all the time for small group home homeschooling. And that's right. Like the, the big idea behind that, and I've worked in charter schools and district schools as, as well, but the big idea behind that is exactly what you said. You don't need to be the expert in algebra and in literature. And I mean, it's going to be a rare person that that has both of those things, like a, a real strong humanities background and a real strong STEM background. So you're going to have holes. But like you said, the the willingness to be self-taught and to know how to know how to learn, like the the, the meta aspect of it, which is what I I, I really like, but uh, I, I want to go back a little bit before we explore that further. Y you said you were in the military too, and you were at different parishes. Just to, just to get a little bit more of the the background, do you have any relationship with the chaplain? And and were you were you a cradle Orthodox, or did you convert at some point? Um, well, I was actually went to a Protestant, like an evangelical Protestant church, till I was probably in fifth or sixth grade, and then my parents decided that they wanted to try something different, like it wasn't working for them. And so they dragged us to every single Orthodox church in the <laughs> Twin Cities, or it felt like it anyway. I don't know if it actually was, but we had to go to all of them. And then we converted probably a couple of years later. Um, and yeah, it was a different, it was a very, very big switch, I think, going from Protestant to you know, kind of more of a Hyde church um, scenario. I just, I remember my first time in an Orthodox church and I was just overwhelmed by like, you know, incense and all of that. So it was just a lot. And then um, later when I turned 18, I joined the army right out of high school and they did actually offer Orthodox services at the wow. basic training, which was pretty incredible. It's, it was a lot harder to find them later, but um, for that particular um, basic training and year that I was there, they had Orthodox services. Um, I don't think there's very many Orthodox chaplains in the military. I did check a few years ago just because I was curious to see who the chaplain was, if I could find him. And there's like 
two or three of them in the yeah. entire army. So he was pretty easy to find. And I was like, oh, look, he's still there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Faithfully but, uh, work in that plot of land. Yes. Sowing yeah. the seed. That That's so beautiful because so you have a homeschooling background, um, a, a military and so a veteran background, as well as this background, like I said, with Father Mark and, and Dr. We froze. In specific ways. So you, you began writing this book, you said, what is it, a few, a few, a few years ago. T tell us um, what, <laughs> what was the reaction of some of the parents around you when, when I'm sure they found out through word of mouth or through you. Uh, I'm sure you didn't have it under wraps the whole time that that you were making such a guidebook. Um, you know, I I think I did mention it to a few people. I'm not really like the type of person to go around and be like, "Hey, I'm you know, this is what I'm doing right now." I just kind of I think Father Mark probably talked about it more than I did, where I was just kind of more like, I just wanted to do it and complete it because I'd never completed a project like that before so you know for me i i hope that they were excited like i think there were some people that i mentioned you know oh i'm writing a book i hope it will be helpful um and yeah i don't know like i said i i really tried hard to not say much about it just until it was done you know because i didn't know how long it was going to be you know it took me five years and some days i only had time to write like a sentence <laughs> so yeah. You know. That's good though. You you kept you kept chugging. You kept going at it, and I I really appreciate this idea of no curricula. So a couple years ago, based an influence again from the OCABs folks, I wrote an article. We celebrate Theophany or Epiphany very largely in the Ethiopian community, and I had this uh, this contribution to uh, one of our our magazines. Um, for Epiphany, which is bilingual. It's in Amharic and it's in English. And I wrote a short article basically trying to take away everybody's excuses. Because like like you said, you you ran into some failure or some struggles. And so you you asked for kind of like a lifeline from Father Mark. And uh, he's like, no, you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna have to drag <laughs> yourself out of there. And I and and I I love that because through that struggle, you were able to now produce this this book that's now going to be helpful to other people that are in a like situation. And so I, I've come across a lot of parents too, you know, uh, some, some of them that say, Oh, how do I get my little boy or little girl to be more like you and like scripture and be a deacon and all of these things. And the advice that I gave them is like, if you have a basic literacy, you can at least do that. And even if you don't understand the narrative going on, maybe your hearers will understand. And so maybe you'll have some sort of salvific grace for, for them. And that's kind of the encouragement I had. So rather than curricula um, and, and rather than some of the, the smells and bells, I was reading the review of your book from Father Dustin Lyon too. And it was, it was very touching, very beautiful. Uh, and he, he talked about how, you know, sometimes we have such a vast, beautiful structure within orthodoxy that sometimes we try to teach people the advanced things, the, the things that you should maybe pick up after you have mastered the fundamentals, whereas your book comes in and teaches people the fundamentals of, of what they need to know. So rather than being a curriculum, how, how is it that you, your book, A Light in the Darkness, seeks to be that light for parents stumbling through the darkness of trying to provide a, a biblical education for, for the youth? Well, I, my goal was to kind of help take the pressure off of parents, you know, like I feel like as a parent, you, you feel this duty to raise your children in the church, you know, and to, but I think where that kind of gets to be a little tough is that um, you start to think that you can control the outcome by, you know, teaching your children um, these things or teaching them about the church or teaching them, you know, even teaching them scripture. Like I can teach my kids scripture, but I can't control what's going to happen. And I feel like I see a lot of that, you know, I'm in a few um, 
Orthodox moms groups on Facebook. And I see a lot of people panicking about their kids leaving the church or not wanting to participate in church, you know, and I think our duty as parents is to just, you know, take scripture, teach it to them, but you're just planting the seed. You're, you can't, you know, you said some people were saying like, how do you make your kid like scripture? Well, you can't make your kid like scripture. You can't like, I'm not, I don't want to promote this idea that I'm sitting around with my kids and they're just so happy to be sitting and studying scripture with me. They don't, they don't like it. It's work, you know, (laughs) so it's a lot of work and, you know, and I, but I just hope that, you know, my enthusiasm, you know, will show them that it's something important. Well, not even my enthusiasm, God will show them, (laughs) you know, what's important and you know god is the one who is going to plant that seed or make it grow like i can just all i can do is offer what i have and what i know and so my hope is is that will you know release parents from this idea that you know you have to control the outcome because i was very relieved (laughs) when i realized oh i'm not in control god is in control and so that's what i hope with the book that i'm showing you know, showing people that they don't have to control this outcome. It's just you're presenting information to your children. I love that. The the paradoxical shepherd and lamb, our savior, is seated in the heavens and, and he's in control. So we don't have to be in control. It's a, it's a very like laissez-faire, let it be, let alone type attitude that you have that as long as you're faithfully and continuously sowing the seed, that, you know, you hope for something and you're confident that something will happen, but you're not trying to, to mangle them. I know in my, in my own personal life, my parents never forced me to go to church. I would go like once a month and stuff as a, as a kid. And that was usually with my aunts because they were more active. My parents would go once or twice a year, year, you know, they were Christmas, Easter, theophany Christians at, at best. And even that was just, you know, to get us involved in the culture and, to go through the motion as, as nominal Orthodox, but they've never been, you know, regular Sunday Christians. So my coming into the faith and into the diaconate and all that, it, it's really, like you said, it's a work of God. And I always attribute, a lot of people don't know this about my mother because she doesn't go to church. They think she doesn't care. We grew up and my sister and I turned out differently, but every night she used to read the Bible to us when we used to go to bed. And, you know, originally it's like a children's Bible version. And then, and maybe later, a more serious one, but I I would love to get your take on on uh, let's let's go with two distinctions. Let's start with the idea of using like a children's Bible or a teen's Bible versus using like you know an, a Bible that is maybe addressed for adults. Do you have any thoughts or opinions on on what to use and and if you would use anything differently at different stages of, for example, your son's um, growth? Um. Well, you know, I have. I have several thoughts about that. I, you know, Father Mark doesn't like the children's Bibles and I don't love them. Like, I think that it's better to, you know, I think kids are more capable of things than we, they're more capable than we give them credit for, you know? And I think, but you know, I also, as a kid, you know, in the Protestant church, they do use a lot of like, um, kids Bibles. And I remember reading like a graphic novel Bible, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, um, when I got a little bit older and eventually I worked my way up to, you know, the Bible, but you got to think that, you know, there has been many, many centuries of Bible study without these things, without children's Bibles. (laughs) And, you know, we didn't, this is, that's a relatively new phenomenon. They so didn't I have would, the the graphic novels of uh, Genesis back in the first century, <laughs> right? I know, right? <laughs> so, and what, I think those things can be helpful, but they can also be detrimental because they're also then offering someone else's interpretation mm-hmm. rather than the actual text. So you kind of have to be careful because you don't you want to give your children the text, like what's actually there, and I think. You know, as I said, I think children are far more capable than we give them credit for. Like, for example, the children at St. Elizabeth are memorizing the book of Galatians. Beautiful. And Father didn't give them the easy translation. They're doing the King James version. And they can do it. <laughs> like, they're doing it. It's amazing to listen to. Like, when they, you know, 
Did they? I think they're up to chapter four now, but to listen to them recite the first three chapters in the King James, it's just amazing. It's astonishing what God can do <laughs> with, yes. when yeah. given the opportunity. When I worked in schools, um, they call this the difference between fluency and comprehension, right? The fluency, just the ability to get through a word or a turn of phrase and the comprehension, actually understanding what it is that you're reading. And the Ethiopian tradition, the Ge'ez right, has a huge tradition where you are not cognizant, you are not comprehending what you're doing, but you learn how to read and write originally. Like they stopped this when the communists took over and, and later the, the current federal democracy took over. But in my parents' time, the way somebody learns how to read and write is the, the neighborhood priest teaches you to read the first John, the epistle of first John then you read the gospel of John, then you read uh, the Psalms of David and you read it in like three different kind of like, you know, this like melodic reading that you do in the church. Mm -hmm. So that's how they actually learn how to read. And they're doing it in Ge'ez, which is not even the vernacular. Their vernacular is Amharic. So it, it, it'd be as if, you know, American children are like reciting the Bible in Latin. Like Latin is this one of the bases of English, but you know, we don't speak Latin. We might recognize some of the phrases that that look the same, that are cognates. So my parents, they learned how to read and write in that way. And when you look at that generation, later on, they begin to comprehend more and they read better. Even in a secular sense, they have like better skills. What I'm thinking about when you're saying this King James English is, you know, the majority of idioms in the English language come from the King James Bible. So these children, whether or not they comprehend every word that they're reciting right now, they're they're gaining that muscle memory and fluency with these words. And I'm sure that their, their secular studies in school are going to be improved by this recitation, like you said, that is laborious, that 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 is a work. It's not necessarily yeah. <laughs> all all giggles and 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 fun and games, but that that's so exciting and that segues to to my next point. So you're using the KJV in your local parish for for the youth. Are there different versions of the Bible that that you've used for your son that you recommend for for other people? I know the Orthodox have had so many um you know, not, not being originally like Anglo, the Orthodox have had so many opinions. You know, I see the new King James version as, as being one of the most commonly accepted. And it's what, you know, the so-called Orthodox study Bible uses from Thomas Nelson, which is a, a Protestant publisher. I have the, the Greek Orthodox Bible, New Testament, which was made by a, a group of, of clergy um, especially led by by Father Laurent uh, as well, but they only made a New Testament. They didn't make the whole thing. Um, there's so many people who have like Septuagint copies from English. I don't. Do you have any favorite version, or do you use multiple versions? Um, well, you know, I've been trying to go more with the King James since the now I know that Father Mark recommended it as being like a closer a truer translation than some of the other ones. Um, when I was young, my dad gave me um, the Oxford Study Bible, I think it's called, it's the RSV. Mm -hmm. And so I used that one um, as I was studying my book or like writing my book, just because it was, I think it's an easier read for most yeah. people. So um, I use, I just kind of go back and forth. Between and those, those are in the same two. tradition. The RSV is supposed to be an updated KJV. The only main, like even the Psalms are almost exactly the same. There, there are certain uh, translation choices they change. And then you got the NRSV, which is like the more, um, you know, the gender neutral version of the, oh. of the RSV. Um, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so th those are in the same vein. Those are, those are in the, in the same tradition. And th yeah, those are two of the ones that I use most oftenly for my podcast. Sometimes I'll use a, a crazier version that is very non-literal just to to see and clarify something if something's different. And and obviously, you know, in, in this new uh, emphasis on the biblical tradition from the Orthodox perspective that, that you and I are a part of, we we try to focus on, like you mentioned earlier, the terms, the words, the the original Greek and, and Hebrew that is behind it. So so that's great. And so you're you're saying you're having younger people recite it as well. I wonder what is so what is the balance between the parents reading the biblical text to the children and then having the children participate in the reading aloud or the recitation? Um, I you know, I try to like some things I will read 
aloud to my kids because I think there's something about hearing it that is important. Um, but I also believe that practicing, so St. Elizabeth's is what I like to call a teaching church. <laughs> and, you know, the children do a lot of the epistle readings and, um, you know, uh, the service before liturgy, I'm drawing a blank on the name of it right now, but um, they read the hours and things like that. Um, so I think having that practice of reading out loud, you know, that's helpful for them in their reading. But I also think it's important to listen and to learn to hear. Um, it's also, you know, an important part of, you know, I talk in my book a lot about um, the thing called narration, which yeah. is you, you listen or you read and then you tell it back, you restate it in your own words. So that really just, you know, cements the information in your mind that helps kids work, you know, work through that. So, um, so I think both, you know, are important and, you know, whatever, I think you decide what is, it's kind of what's up to each parent. Like, cause I don't know what someone else's child's reading level comfort might be, but you know, both are very important. And so you just kind of have to decide what works for your family. I think. That's cool. I, I really liked your emphasis on, narration. So could you tell us, you know, what's the difference between taking one verse and trying to make a, a sermon or a teaching or a lesson plan off of it versus hearing, hearing the narrative, you know, what, what, what changes when you, when you hear the narrative as a, as a totality? Well, you know, I think the narrative is important because you want to you want to get the whole context right. You don't want to just take one verse. Like I've known too many people and read too many books who can take one verse and you can twist it to whatever you want. And I also learned that you know in college too, like how very easy it was to take one or two lines and twist it to make it fit whatever you want. <laughs> so. You know, it's sticking to the text. And I had an English professor who was very adamant about that. She said, you know, you, you couldn't even open your mouth before she said, you know, you need to stick to your stick to the text. Don't talk to me unless you've read the text. And, you know, and so for, you know, narration, you are learning what the text says. So you can't interject your opinion. You don't want the child's opinion. My teacher didn't want my opinion. She doesn't care about my opinion. She wants to know <laughs> what does the text say, you know, and Father Paul and Father Mark say that too. Don't tell me your opinion. <laughs> Come to me and tell me what the text says, and then we can have a conversation. <laughs> so I love your literature teacher. And frankly, I think that's rare nowadays that your teacher is old school. So there's a whole postmodern strain of thought that to to put it simply and i hope this is not reductive that any given piece of literature is infant infinitesimally uh interpretable like you have an infinite amount of meanings that could be ascertained from it so that it is pretty much you know whatever your opinion is which is the opposite of what your teacher is saying your teacher it sounds like is saying there's at least if not one meaning a limited amount of meanings that could be gleaned and and you have to excavate them out out of the the text. So in in your uh, reading and in your narration of scripture, do you see an infinite amount of meanings or a limited amount of meanings? And and how do you you know how do you in, encourage parents to to try to figure out you know what the meanings are with their children? I think that it's important to accept that you're never going to know everything there is to know about the Bible. <laughs> there are, you know, there's, I don't want to say infinite meanings because I feel like that could be misinterpreted, but you know, you will always be learning something from the Bible. There's just layers. It's like an onion. <laughs> you constantly you peel back a layer and you find another one, you know? And so I wouldn't say that there are infinitesimal meanings, but I'm sure that, you know, people can twist it however they want, but not if they read the actual text. If they read the actual text, it kind of doesn't leave a lot of room for argument or interpretation. It's just is what it is. It says what it says. And you just kind of have to accept that, which can be very difficult. Oh yeah. I, I love that. There are, there are anecdotes I could share with you maybe off camera with <laughs> of people <laughs> 
not wanting to accept that. And in fact, I believe you use the word submission, which I like a lot. T tell us, what does it mean to submit to the text or to submit to the story? You have to accept what the story tells you. Like you can't argue it. You can't, you know, change it to fit your worldview because then if you do that, then you're creating your own God and your own, of your own I ideology. And, you know, you have to just be willing to hear it and accept it and move forward with whatever it is that you've learned, which I think is very difficult for a lot of people. Um, me personally, I didn't find it as difficult, I think, but mm -hmm. I think military background helps with that. Yeah, <laughs> I was know, thinking like, that. <laughs> you're kind of used to taking orders and you're like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. And if you, you know, if it doesn't make sense, then you go to someone who knows more than you and you ask for clarification and then you go, oh, okay, so that's what it means. All right, I can do that. So, you know, it's, it's just a matter you have to humble yourself and Fit, you have to like fit yourself to the text, not alter the text to fit you and your life. I, I love that. I growing up had this, I, I don't know if it's not biological, it's it's deeply, you know, from my environment or nurtured at an early age. Because even in like elementary school and in middle school, I had this like clash with authority and then you know somehow become a fan of the most high church authoritative church <laughs> and i think that the issue i had was with arbitrary human authority and father paul nadim tarazi he always talks about how although it's it's very clear and sometimes people lose their faith when they see this but it's very clear the the human element the human hand involved in like the editing of scripture and the gathering of strict scripture you can see how otherworldly it is in terms of every other text is talking about aggrandizing their own community and culture that they're from. And, and here you have the scriptural authors and editors presenting the most self-scathing story and narrative that has ever been presented to, to humanity. It's so self-deprecating at, at each step. And and so, you know, the only hero that you see is is God, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and his his one of a kind son Jesus and and the Holy Spirit that is that is sent to to comfort and and reassure us. So that's that's it's it's interesting how you drew on, you know, this idea of obedience and and following orders in, in the military to applying it to to the biblical text. It, it, are there any words of encouragement or advice you'd have to people who didn't maybe have a of a military background and uh, do you, do you think it's like a, an attacking of our modern sensibilities to to submit in some way like this idea that we are submitting to someone else that that you know we aren't the king oh right i think that's completely natural you know it's a natural human instinct you don't want to submit you want to who do you think you know who do you think you are to boss me around you know i think that's kind of most people's reactions and i think you know in today's culture it's so normal to customize everything to fit your worldview i mean we're told constantly and i hate this phrase more than anything else to speak your truth and hold on to that and so but there is no your truth there's only the truth god's truth and then you don't get to take it and fit it for you you have to fit and conform yourself to that and you know i think it's a natural instinct of people to shy away from authority, at least for Western culture. I don't know, like for other, I know other places, you know, it's a little bit more normal, but you know, for America in particular, I would say it's a very challenging concept. <laughs> yeah, it, it rubs against the rugged individualism. <laughs> right. That's, that's well put. So let, let's, let's do the hard plugging. I'm going to throw some links up to the Amazon. Can you tell everyone just again, the title of your book and what, like what formats can it be found in, in terms of ebook print? And I don't know if, if you're thinking or planning about an audio book. Um, well, right now it's, uh, the light and the darkness, a Bible study for children and teens. It's available on Amazon. I believe it's just available in paperback right now. Um, I don't know if there's any plans for anything else, <laughs> but um, but that's what's that's what's available at the moment. Um, an audiobook would be cool. I hadn't thought about that, but 
I like that idea because, you know, again, then it's hearing and practicing hearing. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm working on my own projects and plan to be doing uh, some, some of my own projects like that and, and working with some other people. So that whole voice space and, you know, Father Paul and, and Father Mark and, and Dr. Richard have been, you know, for six years pushing in this in this podcasting space, but the voice space goes beyond podcasting. It goes to audiobooks too. So I just love the idea of having it in every format. If you hadn't thought of it, like you said, I would definitely encourage you to to do it yourself. But if it be, if it began to be too much of a labor of work and you were not interested, I'm I am sure that I would love to do it. I haven't even read it yet, but I'm sure I would love to read it out loud. But it's always best in in the author's voice. I, I've read, mm -hmm. I've listened to audiobooks. I just finished one this morning, and I'm close to finishing another from the author themselves. And then I've I've listened to some that are from other people, and and it's great. There are some people who are great, like voice actors, and who have that you know that that classic radio voice. But there's just nothing like the author doing it. So yeah, <laughs> that's my heart. Ask to you something about that <laughs> for the author reading their own book. It's like you're hearing it how it was meant to be. Yeah, there's just no questions, you know, in terms of word selection and inflection and 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 all that. So yeah, if it's if it's not too much homework, I, I guess I'm I'm here inviting you to my podcast and giving you homework too <laughs> to bless us further. <laughs> I will look into it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Do you have any uh, other parting words to to everybody, just in terms of encouraging them to read scripture and then to read your book about scripture, the meta book? Right. Just, you know, just, just start, just start by reading. It doesn't have to be super long, you know, just, you know, just pick a few verses and go from there. Just work your way through one book, pick a book and, you know, just work your way through it. And hopefully, you know, God willing, my book will be a little help, a little tool that you can use to help excavate <laughs> the wealth that is the Bible. <laughs> Oh, amen. Amen. And and, and this, this might be uh, too childish of me, but since it's about a children's book, I get to ask, do you have a, a favorite book that you've read maybe the most? You said the children have read Galatians a lot. I don't know if that's your favorite or if you have another favorite to, to recite to your son and to others. Um, well, you know, for just for reading out loud, I don't know about reciting, but like, I think for children, like, especially young children, you know, the more narrative style stories, so like anything in the Old Testament, like the early like Genesis and Exodus, those are really great for kids. You know, and if you happen to be studying ancient history around the same time, that's kind of cool, because then you can see some crossover there you know and of course the gospels are great because jesus is always going somewhere and always doing something you know so just pick one of those and go for it <laughs> i love it i love it thank thank you so much this was really fun yeah thank you